Thank you so much for joining us online today. We sure miss seeing you all in person and can't wait to welcome you back at Science North and Dynamic Earth later this year. We're happy to provide you this programming for free, but would appreciate a donation that can help us continue to bring you great science experience for years to come. You can donate through the Eventbrite registration for any of our workshops or click on the donate link at sciencenorth.ca. So today we have Kat here that will be doing a rattlesnake demonstration. Hello. My name's Kat, oh sorry, <laughs> Kat. <laughs> so my name's Kemi, I'm behind the camera and we will also have Renata, which will be monitoring the questions. So you'll see her pop up right there. <laughs> Hi everybody. <laughs> awesome, okay, well then let's go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome, my name is Catherine. I will be your rattlesnake wrangler for today. And today we are doing our Massasauga rattlesnake demo. So in this demo, I'm going to bring out our resident Massasauga, so you guys can have a look at him. Uh, you'll get a little bit closer, so you can have a close-up look at him, but I will also have some images on the screen behind me here, so you can see some of the uh, more prominent features that we use to actually identify the Massasauga. So let's go ahead and meet our Massasauga. This Massasauga, his name is Tux, and he's been with us... I don't know if you can hear him or not, but he's rattling right now. He's been with us for a couple of years, and this is his first time on the table in a number of months, so we're gonna see how he does. Hi. So there he is. Now, if at any point he decides that he does not want to be on the table anymore, I will have to put him away, but we'll see how he does. So we'll, we'll go with whatever he decides to do. So this is Tux. He is an adult Massasauga. He is full grown. He will still grow a little bit throughout the rest of his life, but for the most part, this is as big as he's going to get. This species only reaches a meter in length, which might sound big, but it's actually very small for rattlesnakes in general. They're actually considered a pygmy rattlesnake species because they don't get very big. Here, I'll turn them back around. So today we're going to go over where you can find these guys and what to do in case you ever get bit by one and like how to identify them, that sort of stuff as well. So to start off with, let's look at where you can find these guys. Historically, they were found throughout Southern Ontario, but currently they're only found in the following four locations. So if you look at the map behind me, I'm gonna turn them back towards you for a second. Over on that side there, you can see along the Eastern shore of Georgian Bay, you can find them up the Bruce Peninsula, down near Windsor, and then over in Lansley Bog in the Niagara area, you can find them as well. So if you're ever in any of those four locations, you do want to keep an eye out for the Massasauga. And as you can see historically, they were throughout Southern Ontario. The reason they are no longer found there is they don't really live great where people are living, right? So when we moved into the area and we developed all down in that area, they lost a lot of their habitat and they kind of left those areas. So that's why they're down to only the four. So if you are in those areas, you want to be able to identify these guys. So the next part, we're gonna go over how to identify a Massasauga compared to the other snakes in Ontario. Of course, it is the only venomous snake in Ontario currently. Historically, we did have a second rattlesnake species, the timber rattlesnake, but, <laughs> just a second, there we go. Um, but they have been extirpated from Ontario, so you can no longer found, find them here. The Massasauga is currently the only one within Ontario. Within Canada, we do have two other venomous snake species. Both of them are out west. So, first way to identify them, of course, they are a rattlesnake, so you have the lovely rattle on the end of their tail. We actually have a rattle here, if you'd like to have a closer look at one. The rattle itself is made when they shed. So it's just made of dead skin. Each time they shed their skin, it adds another link onto that rattle. And the sounds you hear are just the parts of the rattle rubbing against each other when they vibrate it really, really quickly, which is very, very cool. But that does mean that they can lose their rattle because it is just made of dead skin. So you could come across a rattlesnake with no rattle, but even if that were to happen, the end of his tail would not be long and skinny like the other snakes we have in Ontario. It would be very blunt, just like the end of his rattle. I'm going to turn you back around now. Mm -hmm. So the rattle is the easiest way to identify him, but from there, there are a couple aspects on his body that you want to look for as well. Number one, the size and shape of his body. He is a short, 
wide-bodied snake, and that's the way he's supposed to be. These guys are not long and skinny like the other snake species that we have in Ontario. From there, you want to look at the markings. So this kind of marking that you see going down the back of the rattlesnake, those are called saddle markings, and his are in the shape of bow ties. Hence the name Tux. He's a very fancy snake. He always has his bow ties. All Massasaugas have saddle markings that are shaped like bow ties. Other snakes in Ontario will have saddle markings, but theirs will not be pinched in the center like a bow tie. Maybe one or two, but not all the way down their back like the Massasauga. From there, we're going to move towards the Massasauga's head. So if you look at his head and neck, you can see that his head is very wide and triangular shaped. And his neck is itty bitty. So very skinny neck, very wide head. The other snakes in Ontario have very, like, not very much of a difference there. Their head and neck are basically the same size. So you want to look for that triangular shaped head. From there, we're going to go in a lot closer. It might be easier to see these features on the screen behind me. So these guys have a very cool feature. They actually have a vertical pupil. So if you were to look them in the eye, it would look like a cat's eye. And again, the only snake in Ontario with the vertical pupil. But just like a cat's eye, their pupil can dilate to become round depending on the lighting they're in. So that can change. From there, if we move from their eye to their nose, you'll actually notice in between the two, there's a second hole. Now that is a heat pit. So he's actually able to sense heat. He's part of the pit viper family. An idea of what that would look like, I'm gonna put up behind me in a second. But the last thing I wanna mention before that is something that's inside his mouth. So of course we can't see it right now, but if you were to look inside his mouth, you would see that he's got fangs and of course venom. Now the venom glands are actually towards the back of his head. One reason why he has the wide head, right? And they're injected, the venom is injected through the fangs. So the fangs are hollow. Now the cool thing is you can't just see his fangs. They're not hanging out the side of his mouth, right? And the reason for that is his fangs are actually on a bit of a pivot. So they're stored up in the roof of his mouth and when he needs them, they'll actually swing down, he'll bite, inject into whatever he needs to, and then swing them back up into his mouth. So they're stored out of the way in little fleshy sheets. Very cool. Cat? Yes. Yes, so people want to know how many rattlesnakes are there in the world and in Canada? So within Canada, we have three species. So we've got the Massasauga rattlesnake here in Ontario. And then out west, we have the northern Pacific rattlesnake and the prairie rattlesnake. For worldwide, I'd have to look up to get the exact number. So I can find that for you once I've put him away. Now, the other cool part with the venom is the type of venom these guys have. They have what's called a hemotoxin. So it acts on the blood. And it's basically made up of digestive enzymes. So similar to what's in our stomachs. It's not a neurotoxin. A neurotoxin is very different because it actually paralyzes wherever it spreads to, which is different ballgame entirely. So these guys have a hemotoxin. Now I have mentioned the heat sensitive pits. So I'll give you an idea of what that looks like behind me here. So using his heat sensing, he can actually see or sense heat. If he's looking at something cold blooded, it's gonna be the same temperature as the environment around him which will usually be like the blues and greens and the cooler colors. If he's looking at something that is warm blooded or just warm in general, it's gonna give off the warmer colors. So the yellows, whites, reds, right? Much brighter colors. He can use that to hunt, which actually means he can hunt in total darkness. He doesn't need light to be able to hunt. He can sense heat instead. He can also use this to find basking sites. He is cold blooded, he does need to find a way to warm himself up. So he can find temperature gradients in the environment around him as well. Now it does have some limitations though. His heat sensing is only good for about 60 centimeters, but it is very accurate. He can sense the difference, uh, like differences between temperature of about 0.2 degrees. So that's pretty impressive. Okay, so we've covered- okay, so that, Yes. We have a question here. Uh, will they get affected from poisoning their food at all? So that's a very good question. So the cool part there is because their venom 
uh, is similar to a stomach acid, they're actually able to digest their venom. So they can eat it with no problem. But if one Massasauga were to bite another Massasauga and inject the venom into like the body of the snake and not into the digestive system, that would cause damage, just like it would to us. It would be similar to us taking our stomach acid and injecting it into our arm. It would be very unpleasant. Okay, so we have another one. Uh, yeah. it, how, how venomous is it? Like, is it dangerous for people? So, and how does it compare to other venomous snakes? So that's a very good question. Now, these guys here actually rank, I think it's 73rd, but it's in the 70s um, for most venomous on the planet, which is very low. So he's in the 70s. He's not very venomous. He is still considered a medical emergency if you get bit, but he's not considered deadly. Have people died from the bites? Yes. But at this point in time, it's over 50 or 60 years now since somebody has actually died from a Massasauga bite. And those that did, did not receive treatment. So they didn't get to a hospital to get treatment. Yeah, cool. So knowing that it is venomous, do you ever handle it with your hands? No. There's some <laughs> the only safe way to handle him would be to tube him first, which would be taking a plastic tube and sticking it on his head. And at which point he can't bite, and then you can pick him up if you need to do any sort of like vet procedures or anything like that. Um, so that'd be the only way to actually safely handle him. But for him in particular, we have not tubed him yet, so I've never done that with him. But I have tubed one of his predecessors, so I have handled a Massasauga before. But that is the only safe way to do so. Otherwise, you always have to use your snake hooks. Okay, so I have a little bit more info to give you guys, and I'll also be taking more questions. So we were talking about uh, his venom and his heat sensing, right? So now you know how to identify them, where to find them, uh, and whatnot. So I'm going to cover a couple ways that you can be safe around them. These guys are not aggressive. They are going to prefer you walk away than them have to bite. So number one, you want to make sure you're protecting yourself when you're around these guys. And that means wearing fully covering clothing. So fully covering shoes, full length pants, those are going to help protect you from them. If they do get scared and they do try to bite, it's going to be very low to the ground. They're going to be biting feet and like just above the ankles. You want to protect that area. Now, these guys here are going to warn you first, right? So you want to make sure if you're out in Massasauga territory, you're wearing the proper clothing, but you're also not wearing headphones because you want to be listening for these guys. If you hear a rattlesnake rattle, a lot of people don't know what to do. The biggest thing you want to do when you hear a rattlesnake rattle is you want to stop moving. So a lot of people try to move away from it right away without figuring out where the snake is first. Very important. You need to know where that snake is. So stop moving, locate the snake, and then step away from it. Their strike range is half the length of their body. So again, they max out at a meter, so strike range half a meter. As long as you stay outside of that, so a meter, meter and a half, you are completely out of strike range. They cannot hit you with their strike. They must be coiled in order to strike, but they don't have to be coiled in order to bite. They will always warn first unless you have surprised them. So like say they're hiding under something and you reach under and grab them, they're not going to have time to warn you that they're a venomous snake. So at that point, they're not going to rattle. But if they see you coming, they will rattle to warn you. Once you hear that, you just back away from them. They're not going to chase you. Uh, you back away. You can then walk around them as long as you give them their safe berth. They're not going to go after you. They're not going to follow you. They're going to wait for you to move away from them. Hey, Kat, so we see that it's mostly unlikely that you ever get beaten by, by um, a saga rattlesnake, but... What if, what if you get beaten? What should you do? Uh, that's coming up next. So I'm going to cover that in a little bit. Okay, so let's so wait for that. Finish this a little bit first, and then I'll go into what to do worst case scenario. So you've taken all of your precautions, right? You're listening for them. You're out in the area. Um, if you see one, you're just going to walk around it. You don't even have to like change direction. You can just avoid him and keep going. He's not going to go after you. Nothing like that. But as I mentioned, there is a chance, there is a way, I guess, that you could accidentally surprise him if you were to reach in somewhere and grab him. That can happen. 
let's say you're out hiking and you drop something and it rolls under a bush and you reach under to grab it and there's a mass dog under there and you grab him instead and you get bit. There are a couple of things that you want to do. And there are a couple of things that you do not want to do. Number one, your main concern if you've been bit by a Massasauga is to go to a hospital. You do need to seek medical treatment. But before you leave the site, do not get bit a second time trying to do this, but try and get a picture of the snake. That way when you get to the hospital, you can show them and it'll help identify that it is a Massasauga because we do have a lot of lookalike species. So just be on the safe side. If you can take a picture, if you can't, don't worry about it. The doctors will figure it out. So you take your picture and then you head straight to a hospital. You do not want to drive yourself. You want somebody else to take you there um, be it by ambulance, somebody driving you. You have 48 hours to get to a hospital. So you've got two days. It's slow acting venom, but you do want to go and get checked out. Most adult humans can actually fight off Massasauga venom on their own. They don't even need anti-venom, but you always go to get checked just in case. So you've been bit, you're en route to the hospital. There's a couple other things you want to do. If you have any restrictive clothing or jewelry near the site of the bite, you want to remove that because there will be swelling and you don't want to cut off circulation. We'll talk a little bit more about that after. The other thing is if the bite got dirty, you can rinse it off, but that is it. Do nothing else to that bite. Try and keep it from moving around. So if you're bit in the hand, you don't want to be flailing your hand all over the place. You want to keep it close to you. You want to basically try and slow the spread. So you don't want to be super active and getting your blood pumping. You want to try and stay calm. Um, if you're bitten the foot or something, you don't want to be up and walking around. You want somebody to help you carry you, that sort of stuff. You want to slow the spread. Now, the things that you do not want to do are the things you see in the movies. So one, do not try and suck the venom out of the cut. Two reasons. Number one, it doesn't work. Number two, even if it did work and it's now in your mouth, if you happen to have a cut in your mouth, it's now going into your head. Not a good spot for it, so don't do that. The other people sometimes see, they'll try and cut and bleed the venom out. Again, don't do that. It doesn't really work. At that point, you're just going to have a cut and a snake bite, so don't do that. Lastly, you will see they will tie tourniquets for certain types of bites. Unless you are a trained professional, you should never tie a tourniquet. And in this case, for a Massasauga bite, a trained professional would not tie a tourniquet because it's the wrong treatment. You do not want to tie a tourniquet with a Massasauga bite because of the type of venom. So being the hemotoxin, remember, it causes you to bleed a bit more, right? It acts on the blood. If you tie a tourniquet, that blood still has to go somewhere, and it's going to start pooling internally, which is not a good spot for it. So don't tie a tourniquet with a Massasauga bite. Other than that, you want to head to the hospital. Once you get there, they are going to assess you. So they're going to check and see how much, if any, venom is in your system. Because something that's really cool, if you are bit by an adult Massasauga, they actually have control over how much venom they want to inject. And they can choose to do a completely dry bite. 30% of defensive bites are dry bites. Hey Kat, we have a question related to what you're talking about right now. Can you get treated from a Massasauga snake bite without going to a hospital? No, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'll talk about why in a second. It has to do with the antivenom. So basically the reason you want to go to a hospital, there's two different reasons. One is if you happen to need the antivenom, it's only at hospitals. Because antivenom has a very, well, this antivenom at least has a very short shelf life. It doesn't last very long. So not even all hospitals keep it. And because you have 48 hours to get to a hospital, it's often only hospitals that are in the area where these snakes are found that will carry the antivenom. So if you happen to be one of the people that needs it, you do have to go to the hospital. The other reason you want to go is even if you don't end up needing any antivenom, some people can go into shock from the bite. And if you do not get shock treated, shock can actually kill you. So that's something else you really want to watch out for. And are um, you going to talk you about... Are you going to talk about uh, how do they make the anti-venom? I can, yes. 
Okay, so there are some people wondering about that. <laughs> okay, so with the antivenoms, like once you get to the hospital, they assess you and they figure out whether or not you need antivenom. If you need it, they of course will give it to you. But if you're one of the people that's fighting it off on your own, they'll just watch you to make sure you don't need help with anything else. If you need it, they will give it to you. The antivenom, one of the reasons why it's so uncommon is the short shelf life, but it's also because it's very expensive because it is very difficult and dangerous to make. In order to get antivenom, you have to start out with the actual venom, which means you have to milk the snake. Milking a snake means you take a venomous snake, you get them to open their mouth, stick their fangs in a cup, and get some venom into that cup that you can then take and use in your antivenom. So that is a dangerous process. From there, depending on the type of venom, often horses are actually used because this venom is designed to kill mice. And that's one reason why it doesn't really do a whole lot to humans. And then if you go even larger, it does even less. So they'll often use it on a large animal like a horse, and then they'll collect the antibodies from that animal to make antivenom. It's not always done that way, but sometimes it is done that way. Um, okay. So other than that, the antivenom also has a, is really, really expensive. Um, one vial, depending on the year, is around $2,000. One bite could take 10 vials to treat. Very expensive. Luckily, it is covered by OHIP, so there we're good. But you still don't want to mess with that. Did anybody have any other questions? Yes, there are plenty of questions, but not actually related to the rattlesnake right now. Oh, yes, yes, there are. Uh, what do they eat? Okay, so these guys are mainly a rodent eater. Uh, what they'll do is they'll find a rodent trail, they'll park themselves next to it, and the next time a mouse goes by, they'll strike it, inject some venom, and then let go of the mouse. The mouse will wander off, die from the venom, they'll go over and they'll eat it. So they're very much kind of like an ambush hunter, an ambush predator. Um, but mainly rodents. They will sometimes eat other small animals. Uh, one scientist did see uh, Massasauga use its rattle to lure a frog in and then eat it. <laughs> so pretty cool. But yeah, mainly they prefer warm-blooded prey, like mice, uh, small chipmunks, that sort of stuff. And Kat, do you know if their actual venom is used for any medication or therapy of some kind? Not that I know of, um, but I'd have to actually look into it to double check on that. But not that I know of. All right, it's okay. And how old is Tux? Okay, so Tux, I believe, is three or four now. But I'd have to pull out his papers to double check his exact birthday. He was born in the summer. And I believe this summer, I think he actually turns five. So I think he's four right now. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah so he's four years old right now. I'm going to disrupt the camera for one second, just in case it starts spinning again. There you go. So I can get a closer but safer look. Yeah. Um, yeah. This way can you, yeah. Kat, can you comment if, uh, like, you're, they are active during the night or during the day, and if the uh, light bothers the snake at all? So these guys are more so diurnal, so they are more active during the day, but they will come out at any time of day, um, mainly for basking, right? So they're going to come out in the daytime, bask and warm up. And then as long as it's warm enough, they will be active throughout the night as well. So you can come across one any time of day. They're not really prone to one more than the other, um, yeah. as long as it's warm enough out. Yeah, we have, um, we have a lot of people also asking, how many snakes do we have at Science North? Okay, we have <laughs> one. Um, okay, so I think we got one there. One, two, three, four, five, six. All the rat snakes. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, uh, sixteen, twenty-six, twenty-seven. I think there's twenty-seven. Okay, about that much, eh? <laughs> um, let me see here. Oh, yeah, how long can they live for? Ah, so these guys live 15 to 20 years. So they actually have a decent lifespan. He's still pretty young. And the neat thing with them is even though he is an adult and he is full size, 
he will never fully stop growing. They never do. They just slow down. So once they reach adult size, they'll slow down, but they'll still continue to grow a little bit every year. So he will still get a little bit bigger. And can you tell the difference between a male and a female rattlesnake? So technically, yes, but you have to look inside. So if we were to look at his butt, just down this way, give me your butt. So I'm going to see if I can turn it towards you, but right around here, there is a special scale covering his vent. And inside that vent, either he will have hemikines if he's a boy, um, or he won't have any if he's a girl. You can check it, like a vet could check it, but especially with the venomous species, that's pretty dangerous. So uh, it's not something they go out of their way to check. Mm -hmm. Now, these guys here, he's actually originally from the Toronto Zoo, so they did check him, and that's why we say him, because uh, he's most likely a male. But he was okay. very young when he was checked, so... Okay, so Kat, when is it that the snake use its rattle? Is it when, in, when they are uncomfortable or feeling threatened, or are there any other instances? Fear, yeah. So if he's afraid, he will use his rattle um, because it's a warning, right? So he's going to rattle to warn you and be like, I'm venomous, don't come any closer. Because he doesn't actually want to use his venom. He knows his venom is for his food, and he knows I'm way too big to eat him. So if he can, he doesn't want to waste it on me. That's one of the other reasons why an adult will choose to do a dry bite. They don't want to waste their venom. They have enough venom for multiple bites, but if they use up a lot of it, they will still have to build up more. It's similar to a saliva gland, right? So they can produce more, but they do have a limited amount stored at a time. Now, the babies don't have the same control, but they have the exact same venom. So if a baby bites you, it will inject at least some venom, and you don't know how much. So that's almost a little bit more dicey than dealing with an adult that can choose not to inject any. Can they eat another snake or birds? Uh, they can, but it's not their preferred prey. So they, they mainly like mammals, and these guys are not a climbing species, so they don't often go after birds. Um, but if there was a ground-dwelling bird that they could grab, they probably would. <laughs> Pretty cool. So do all venomous snakes have rattles? Sorry? Do all, do venomous, all venomous, snakes? venomous snakes have rattles? No, only rattlesnakes have rattles. So rattlesnakes are just one type of venomous snake, um, and they're the only one with the rattle. There are a number of other venomous types of snakes that do not have rattles. They do share some other similarities, um, but not all of them. Yeah, and how do their eggs look like? Ah, so that's a really interesting question because massasaugas are actually a live bearing snake. They do not lay eggs, they give birth to live young. And, and did he ever try to escape? No, so if he gets spooked, he, his normal reaction is to coil and see what's going to happen. He could technically try and take off. Once he hits the edge, though, if he did get startled and something was behind him, he usually stops at the edge. If he did try to go over, he's not going anywhere fast because this ground is very smooth and you can't get a good grip on it. A fall from this height wouldn't hurt him, but he wouldn't really enjoy it. Um, and if he ever did decide to do that, I would just hook him and bring him back um, because he can't really move very well on the ground here. Okay. And we have, we have more questions. Can we take more questions? Yeah. Um, I have one other thing. Uh, uh -huh. These guys are highly protected. You do not want to kill a Mastasaga. You are looking at a $5,000 fine and jail time for killing one. Highly protected. So please do not kill them. Just leave them alone. If you need one moved because it's like dangerous to you or your family, you can call the ministry, um, and they usually have people that are trained to safely move them out of the way. Like, say there's one sunning on your front porch. That's a little dangerous. So there is ways to deal with that. Try not to deal with them on your own, please. <laughs> cool. So do they regrow their rattle 
after they fall off? Yes. So each time they shed their skin, it will add another link onto that rattle, making it slightly longer. But eventually part or all of it will break off. And then it will take a number of sheds to actually build it back up. As an adult snake, he's going to shed three to four times a year. So it could actually be quite a few months before he builds up a new rattle. A baby or a juvenile will shed more often, so they will build theirs up a little bit quicker. Yeah, that's really cool, Kat. Uh, are you guys gonna do a feeding now? Uh, we can do the feeding now. Did anybody have any other questions first? We have some other questions coming, let's see. Oh yeah, what is the biggest snake we have at Science North? So the longest uh, and largest at Science North is the gray rat snake. And it's actually the longest snake species in Canada. They average about six foot in length, but the record is just over eight feet. So they are very big snakes. Oh yeah, someone is asking how they compare to the pythons. <laughs> Tiny. <laughs> so pythons can get very large. None of our snakes can get the size of pythons. Some of the pythons, like the largest ones out there, can be the length or close to the length of a school bus, like big snakes. <laughs> yeah. So why are the Massasaga rattlesnakes so precious? And what environments do they live in? So these guys here do fill a niche. Um, they are a predator, right? So they do eat rodents, and rodents can cause problems. So they do fill one of those niches. Um, and considering we did have two rattlesnake species filling that niche at one point, and we're down to only one, we don't want to lose a spe another species filling that, that gap, right? So these guys are highly protected. Plus, because they're not actually considered deadly, and they only bite when put into bad situations, um, it's quite easy, once you have the proper training, to live around these guys safely. Yeah, so someone is asking if we release snakes back into the wild after they have babies, and if they have babies, babies at Science North. So we don't actively breed any of our animals, um, but they are still wild animals, so sometimes they choose to do that on their own, at which point we do not have the proper setup or the proper permits to actually release into the wild, so we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, any offspring would have to stay either here at Science North or they would have to go to another accredited facility. Okay, and how many babies do they have and how big are they? Okay, so the Massasauga, um, an adult female, a large female, can have more than a smaller female. And it can be anywhere from like 5 to 20. And then even on there, you've got a little bit of leeway. So they can have quite a few babies at a time, which can be rather startling, especially if you're a scientist or a researcher studying these guys in the wild and you catch one that you don't realize is a gravid female and you put her in a bag or a bin or something and then you open the bin and there's now 20 rattlesnakes in there instead of just one. <laughs> okay, and then we have one last question because there's a lot of people asking for the feeding. How did tucks end up living at Science North? So our very first snake, his name was Russ, and he came here because somebody had caught him and illegally tried to smuggle him into the States to sell him. Um, so the, they were caught, they were fined a lot of money, but unfortunately these guys have a very small home range and they didn't know where Russ had come from. So they weren't able to put him back in the wild. Their home range is only 400 square meters. Yeah, it's quite tiny. Um, so instead, they had to house him at a facility. He moved around a bit before we adopted him here at Science North, and he lived out the rest of his life with us. He lived to be over 20 years old. Uh, he did pass away a number of years ago, at which point we did put out feelers to see if there were any massive saga offspring that were in human care that needed homes or that could be borrowed. And that's when we found out about the Toronto Zoo's program. So the Toronto Zoo is one of the places that actually has the permits and can breed and release. So they actually help wild populations. And Massasaugas are one of the species that they do that with. So what they've done is they've actually lent us one of their juvenile males, so Tux here, 
um, because he's not being currently used in the breeding program. So he is not releasable, but one day he could go back, be used as a breeder, and his offspring could end up in the wild. Really cool. Are you going to explain how the rattles make the, their noise? How they make the noise? So yeah. the rattle are the different pieces. So each time he sheds, it's a different piece, right? And it's those pieces actually rubbing against each other that makes the sound. There's, it, so it's kind of not named properly because there's nothing rattling around inside. It's just the, the pieces rubbing against each other that actually makes the sound. If you give that a bit of a shake, you might hear a bit of the sound. Yeah, we can hear the sound, but it's a little bit hard to focus. I'll let yeah, you guys go yeah. to the feeding. Yeah, we can do the feeding. So I'm going to go ahead and put him back in his bin. Now, with the feeding, I don't want to set that up. There we go. With the feeding, um, I do have to give a bit of a disclaimer. It is a dead mouse, so there's no worries there, but he's not always hungry. So we're going to see if he's hungry. Hopefully he is, but there is a chance he might not be. But we're going to try anyway. The cool thing is if he does want to eat, he actually does bite and uh, envenomate the mice, which is pretty neat to see. So we're going to head over there now. I'm going to have to leave my mic here. So I'm just going to take that off real quick, and then we're going to head over. Hey, Camille, can you answer a couple of questions for us while we sure. wait for that? Okay, so how long is Tux? More than 30 centimeters, I would say. Like he's, how? He's about half a meter. Half a meter. Mm -hmm. Can they climb over walls? No. <laughs> no, no. They're not good climbers. <laughs> if, if, if you've got a number oh, of... Oh, caused this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you have, like, a lot of things sticking out of the wall, like giving it steps, possibly. They definitely could try that. If you're talking, like, a sheer wall, these guys are not designed for that. They're very much on the ground snakes. They can swim, though. So you can find them on islands. Do you want me to grab something for you? Uh, no, I'm okay if you want to just follow behind. We'll see if he's hungry. Oh, hopefully they are. And are they rare snakes? Sorry? Are they rare snakes? Um, they are. So they are considered a species at risk. Uh, that's the other reason why you can't hurt them. So they're, like, within Ontario, they're uncommon. But if you actually go to a location where they're found, one of those four areas, within those areas, they are fairly common. Okay, it's really cool that you you're taking us backstage there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have many backstage areas, but this is one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And how fast can they move? So movement wise, they're not very fast, um, but their strike is. So their strike is lightning fast, but their actual movement, if he's just slithering, he's not that quick. Like a person could easily outpace him. Cool. Uh, hello. Just gonna set this back here. Let's put him We're back. We're really excited back here. <laughs> Have any of you ever been beaten? Not yet, and I'm hoping to keep it that way. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I see that you handle the snake very safely. Yes. Okay, so if you want to keep an eye on him, okay. I'm going to get his food ready. Camille, how good is their eyesight? Not good. Not very good. They depend more so on oh, movement, gonna get this. Um, and they're very nearsighted. So they prefer more their, like their sense of smell and their heat sensing. Um, but yeah, vision, very nearsighted. Now, let us see. So we, uh, one of our staff did a beautiful drawing on his food right here. <laughs> <laughs> 
We have to identify which mouse has the vitamin E in it because that's the first mouse they'll eat. Okay. Make so sure they explain? get all the vitamins. Okay. Can you explain okay. what, what we're going to do right now? Yeah. So I'm about to feed them. So you will see a dead mouse now. I warn you for anybody who doesn't like that, there will be a dead mouse now. Um, I'm going to offer him food outside of his strike range. Uh, if he wants it, he usually will strike the mouse. If not, he's just going to ignore it. And unfortunately, it'll be a little bit anticlimactic. But and do you have to warm? Do you have to warm the mouse so um, that he can sense it? No, uh, I could. He would sense it easier that way. But he will actually take them at room temperature. Okay, I'll let you take over. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so he has struck the mouse. I will now leave the mouse there for him. We can keep an eye on it. Um, his normal tactic is he strikes it and then he circles it once or twice before he eats it. So if you want, you can zoom in a little bit more on him and see how he's gonna, gonna go with this. It's not a super fast process, unfortunately. Um, he, uh, he does take his time. To actually get the mouse down, we're looking at probably 10 to 15 minutes. Wow. And how many do they usually eat? So he's allowed 10% of his body weight in a feeding, uh, which for him would be two mice, two adult mice. Okay. And how often do you feed, feed him? Um, currently, he's at once every two weeks of his own choosing. Um, he could eat once a week if he was hungry, though. I almost thought he was going to go for it. Yeah, he'll probably circle around and then go ahead and try and eat it. Yeah, if we have any other questions, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, well, he does his routine. <laughs> You called it. <laughs> so is this how they do in the wild, Pat? Yes. So in the wild, remember, he'd bite it and wait for it to die, right? And then he'd go find it and eat it because mice will fight back, right? So if yeah. he were to try and grab it while it's still alive, he could get bit. And mice can do a fairly serious bite, which could end up infected and could actually potentially risk the snake's life. So he's going to take as much time as he needs to make sure that mouse is good and dead. Oh, so this is why he's circling around to make sure that the, the mouse is dead? That's my guess, but he okay. is a human raised one. So he might have slightly different quirks than wild ones. But based on wild behavior, that would be my best guess. Yeah. Good. And do they uh, learn from their mothers? No. So these guys, once they're born, she'll hang around them for a bit. Um, but then once she goes on her way for a meal, they go on their way and they, they never really interact again. Okay, that's really cool. And do, does he, do you think it bothers him to be watched? No, um, ever since he was a baby, he's been fed this way. So this is normal for him. Uh, sometimes he does get a little too excited though, and we do have to close it up and let him just eat on his own because he gets distracted by us and doesn't eat because he's looking for more food. But I think he'll do pretty good this time. He doesn't seem super distracted by us. He okay. looks like he's going to start at the butt, so um, he's going to do it backwards. <laughs> oh, yeah, they usually start uh, from the head, eh? Yeah. Okay, so do they eat bugs? <laughs> Sorry? Or do they eat bugs? This species, no, um, but some snake species will. Okay. Oftentimes, uh, like milk snakes will eat things like grasshoppers, worms, that sort of stuff, other snakes. Um, Massasaugas, though, prefer uh, mainly rodents, uh, the occasional 
uh, frog or other small creature, but uh, do they do they have any predators? Cat? They do, yes. Um, so milk snakes, which are not venomous, will actually eat massasauga rattlesnakes what? because milk snakes are a snake eater. So um, if they get a small enough massasauga, they will try and eat it. Um, beyond that, these guys do have a number of predators. So again, because their venom is only in their head, so this is actually neat. the difference between venomous and poisonous, right? He's venomous. He's not poisonous. So you can technically eat him safely. A poisonous animal, you wouldn't be able to. But because he's venomous, his bite is dangerous, but eating him is not. So there are a lot of animals out there that if they find a dead one, or if they're quick enough to kill one, they will actually kill and eat these guys. So like large birds of prey, larger mammals that are fast enough would, would go after these guys. Um, that being said, if you ever come across a dead Massasauga, say like on the highway or something, do not touch it. Because if it's recently dead, it can still have some reflex left in it and you could actually be bit by a dead Massasauga. So please don't do that. Um, the yeah. other reason you wanna pick them up off the highway and like take them home or something like that, or take the rattle, is if somebody were to see that, um, if the, uh, like a cop or something, right, you can't prove that you weren't the one that killed it for that. So because they're protected, you can't keep parts from them, unfortunately. Okay, and Kat, we commented that they usually start eating uh, from the head. Is that a yes. reason for it? Yes. So head first, all of the limbs fold really nice and it just kind of goes down easy. If he goes butt first, all of the limbs stick out and it's much harder for him to swallow it. He usually still can, um, but if it does give him enough trouble, he'll actually stop, spit it out and then try from the other end. And what is the largest size of mouse that he can take? So he can eat something three times the size of his head which is very impressive because as you can see, that mouse is not three times the size of his head. So he could actually take a larger mouse than that one. Mm-hmm. And do they usually... Similar... Sorry? Sorry? Sorry, you can go. <laughs> it's similar to us being able to swallow a watermelon in one bite. It's kind of impressive. <laughs> yeah, but they have special bones in their skull, eh? That allows they them do. to do that. Yes, so their jaw is actually set up very different than ours. Um, so our jaw just has the two hinges on either side. Yeah, sure. Um, so our jaw has just one hinge on either side, right? On a snake, they actually have two hinges on each side. So he can do the up and down motion like we do normally. But if he needs to, instead of just going up and down, he can also use an extra and extend the jaw to open it that much wider and then fold it back into place. It's very cool. Wow, that's really cool. Oh, yeah, so looks like he'll take it. Yeah, he's doing pretty good. Oh, yeah, cat. What is a dry bite? So a dry bite is when he chooses not to inject any venom. So he still bites, but no no venom is injected. Yeah, some people are wondering if they have bones in their body. They do. They actually have a full skeleton. They're just very flexible. So he's got a skull. He's got a spine. He has a lot of ribs. Uh, and then he's got a tail. He, of course, doesn't have any limbs or a pelvis, so he doesn't have anything like that, but he has the rest of the skeleton. Yeah. Is he going to eat the whole mouse? Yes. So he'll eat that all in one go. He has no way of breaking the mouse up, so he has to eat it whole. Mm -hmm. And do they get big enough to eat rats? Uh, this species, he could eat a juvenile rat, but not an adult. And I... I don't, like, I think maybe the largest Massasauga could get might be able to take a small rat, but not a big one. They're just yeah. really not a very big snake. And how long is their uh, digestive system? So it'll take him three to five days to digest that mouse um, before he'll actually go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm imagining the size of his poop. Yeah, it's it's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're coming to an end here, everyone.
uh, we can take any last questions. Like some, some people are wondering if they poop. Yep. So they do poop, but they actually do both at the same time. So they only have one outlet, really. Um, that's their vent, right? So where his genitals are stored, where he goes to the bathroom on a female, where she'd lay her eggs through, where she goes to the bathroom, it's all the same spot. Um, and so because of that, when they do go to the bathroom, they do both at the same time. So they do the urates and the feces all at once. Uh, so their poop looks a lot like bird poop. It's got the white and brown in it. Very cool. Well, thanks a lot for joining everybody. We have plenty of other sessions uh, happening twice every day throughout the week. <laughs> Do you want us to go around? Well, he's actually turning this way a bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Because we might be able yeah. to see him swallowing from a different angle. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a good idea. And how long can their uh, venom last, Cat? Um, what do you mean by that? I don't know, because it's somebody asking. Um, yeah, let's, well, if you're, if you are the owner of the question, like, just let us know what exactly you want to know. Because, like, if you're talking, if you've been envenomated, so, like, if they've injected venom into you, um, like, it take, it can take up to 48 hours to have a reaction. And then it'll take a couple of weeks to kind of like heal from it. Um, but if you're talking about just like venom that's been in, like, sorry, that it has been released, I guess. Um, maybe, I actually don't know. <laughs> yeah. can, you tell, can you tell if they made a dry bite? Like if, if, if you can tell that they made a dry bite, do you still um, need to go to the hospital? Uh, it's still a good idea to go because there's no way to 100% for sure tell that it's a dry bite. Um, if there's a, like a lot of venom, you're going to feel it. If there's only a little bit of venom, it could take a while for it to actually kick in. So you might think it's a dry bite and it might not be. Uh, it's better to go to the hospital. They'll do a test, like a blood test, and see if you have any venom in your system. Uh, and then they'd know for sure if you had a dry bite or not. Yeah. And how do they look like when they're sleeping? Um, so they look the same as they do when they're awake because they actually can't close their eyes. So they have uh, a clear scale that covers their eyes. Uh, so their eyes are always open or in another way, always closed because they can just see through the scale. Cool. Yeah. Oh, let's so, finish with a different look. From yeah, let's have that the front. Yeah. Are you scared to deal with a rattlesnake? No, I have a, quite a bit of training to, to work with him, so I feel quite safe working with him. Um, and I do train other people to actually work with him as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I have about 12 years of experience working with them, so I feel quite confident with them. But that being said, I still would never trust him. I would never try to touch him or anything because he is still a venomous snake. But actually, if you want to zoom in, you can see he's actually... Almost got it down. It's just the head left. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Do they die after they bite? No. So these guys here, um, their venom is similar to saliva. Like it's, it's made in a similar way. So they can actually make more. They just use it to kill their prey and then they'll produce more afterwards. Cool. Very cool. Well, I guess that's it for us today, Kat. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining. I hope you guys enjoyed. I love the Massasauga, so I always love doing stuff like this. And I'm very excited because I haven't been able to do a Massasauga demo in quite some time. So uh, this was really enjoyable. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Kat. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow, ho hopefully, for other sessions. Bye.